In 1871, Birmingham, Alabama was chartered. After the Civil War, the South had a lot of questions to answer about its changing social landscape and way of life. And one of those answers began to arise in the emergence of industry in a region that had been primarily agrarian. Uniquely, deposits of limestone, coal, and iron ore were not only rich but in the same geographical area, allowing for the creation of steel, which was booming at the start of the Industrial Revolution. Migrants from neighboring states and cities rushed to the new city. Birmingham was named for the successful English industrial city, but it quickly earned the title of the Magic City for its combination of resources rapid growth and industrial success. Among the early migrants were blacks. While the term Jim Crow laws did not exist at the time of Birmingham's founding, the city had various ordinances and social codes that separated black and white citizens, kept black people relegated to specific jobs, and essentially laid the foundation for the establishment of a black Birmingham within and alongside the rest of Birmingham, establishing presidents that would become hard to fight against in the future. Black residents desired their own place of worship, separate and safe, to freely pray, learn, and praise. So in April of 1873, the first colored Baptist Church of Birmingham was incorporated. The church worshiped in storefront structures before purchasing land at its present site of 6th Avenue and 16th Street North. Under the leadership of Reverend Dr. William Pettiford, the first modern brick building was completed in 1884. Pettiford became the church's pastor the previous year and served for a decade. Through his leadership in the church and the community, Pettiford became one of the most influential black civic leaders in the city. Not only was he the pastor of the church, he was also a forward leader in the black community. He organized the Alabama Penny Savings Bank, which was the first black banking institution to organize in Alabama and only the second in the nation. The bank provided black citizens with loans to build homes, churches, and businesses they would have otherwise not had access to. In 1900, he and other black leaders petitioned the Birmingham Board of Education to establish Industrial High School, the first high school for black students. Pettiford and Reverend Charles Booth formed the Birmingham Esonian Baptist Bible College. 16th Street hosted the first classes of the institution. Pettiford died in 1914, and the Penny Savings Bank closed shortly thereafter. The 1901 Alabama Constitution enacted official disenfranchisement against blacks through harsh laws that endorsed white supremacy. Racial issues in Birmingham became more prevalent as officials became more interfering. Successful black society and enterprise now had even more of a target placed on them, and it became clear that no place was off limits to these new laws. In 1908, the church building at 16th Street was condemned. Though records from this time are scarce, the city likely argued that the building was structurally unsound, but instead of prescribing repairs, they ordered it to be demolished, and Birmingham lost one of its earliest architectural marvels. 16th Street was a flourishing church with a beautiful building at a time when the rest of Birmingham was still developing. Much of the city was still relatively sparse, but also many white churches had not yet built brick structures. 
as both the legal and social leaders of Birmingham began to take stronger stances against Birmingham's black citizens, an elegant black church did not have a place where white supremacy reigned. The following year, the church commissioned Wallace A. Rayfield to design a new building. Rayfield partnered with T.C. Wyndham to construct the church. Wyndham, who served as the chairman of the church's trustee board, owned a construction company. The beautiful Byzantine and Romanesque style building was completed in 1911. The building consists of a grand sanctuary and large basement auditorium with Sunday school rooms along the east and west walls. The addition of a 1912 Pilker pipe organ made it the most prestigious black church building in Birmingham. Rayfield, an alum of the Pratt Institute and Columbia University, was the second formally educated black architect in the United States. He designed dozens of black churches, businesses, schools, and homes across the city, often working with Wyndham. The world changed quickly in the early 20th century, and Birmingham was no exception to the rule. In fact, it embodied each change. Since Birmingham grew to significance with the boom of industrialization, the losses of the Great Depression were especially devastating, and the demands of World War II saw Birmingham again grow rapidly as the need for steel dramatically increased. By the 1950s and 60s, Birmingham was still growing, its industry creating affluence that drove what began to embody a truly Southern city. As Birmingham grew, much of the success was seen in Black Birmingham. Black businesses and neighborhoods thrived in competition with the white-owned businesses that forced Black patrons to use separate facilities or even remain outside. The growth of Black Birmingham showed how the city was growing, but it also was an important separate cultural entity. The 4th Avenue Business District was built with Black-run restaurants, shops, doctor's offices, and banks. True Black affluence and excellence were achieved despite restraints that sought to relegate Black people to a lower status. As the black population began to grow and move to other parts of Birmingham, the white supremacist attitudes that already existed began to fester, and they manifested in not just legal or societal ways, but in violence against black people. Beginning in 1947, as black families moved into white neighborhoods, the Ku Klux Klan began to bomb homes to force them out. Birmingham was called Birmingham because of this terror campaign, which totaled 50 bombs between 1947 and 1963. While they first bombed residential targets, the homes of the families who moved into segregated neighborhoods, the Klan also began to target activists working towards integration, bombing both homes and churches. In 1963, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, president of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights and pastor of Bethel Baptist Church, invited the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to come to Birmingham to help lead the Birmingham campaign a series of nonviolent actions against segregation and unjust police action. Martin Luther King Jr., James Bevel, Wyatt T. Walker, and others led sit-ins, marches, and protests that would lead to mass arrests and bring the eyes of the nation on Birmingham. As the SCLC's involvement in Birmingham continued, the movement had a hard time finding protesters. Many in Birmingham could not protest for fear of retaliation. As numbers dwindled, James Bevel, Diane Nash, and others began to train youth volunteers who were willing to be arrested. Despite the misgivings of some leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., they learned how to protest nonviolently, and many of the children began to take on grassroots organizing roles and spread the word about the march. On May 2, 1963, over a thousand students met at 16th Street Baptist Church to participate in the Children's Crusade. The goal was to march to City Hall to discuss segregation with the mayor. Students left their schools and met at the church where they were sent off in waves. The police responded with mass arrest. Almost 1,000 children were carted off to local jails and makeshift detention centers around the city. The police even used school buses to transport them since so many were arrested. Some of the children who were arrested were very young and many were held for multiple days. The children, though scared, responded peacefully even continuing to sing and chant. But the crusade did not stop there. The next day, students left school again to march from 16th Street Baptist Church. 
This time, the police responded with brutality. Commissioner Bull Connor and his officers used water hoses and clubs on the children and let loose police dogs that attacked them. Hundreds were arrested, some after being released just the day before. Still, marches gathered again on May 4th. They were met with similar violence. On May 5th, the protesters marched to a jail where many children were still being held. Protests and clashes with the police continued until May 10th, when businesses were officially desegregated. Footage of the police brutality sparked a national outcry and international attention. President John F. Kennedy addressed it, and there was federal involvement in the resolution of the protests, as well as in the quelling the violence that followed the desegregation announcement. This attention on Birmingham garnered support for civil rights, but it also made segregationists and white supremacists feel even more angry and threatened. In the wake of the Children's March, much attention still rested on Birmingham and the national response to the violent actions by the police that changed many people's opinions and sympathies. Segregationists and white supremacists realized that Birmingham, the most segregated city in America, was in danger of changing in a way that they did not want to see. And in their eyes, 16th Street Baptist Church could carry much of the blame for facilitating the movements that had carefully and insistently fanned the flames of change. During the early morning hours of September 15, 1963, four members of the Ku Klux Klan, who had splintered off in order to take a more violent action against integration, planted dynamite in a timing device under the back stairs of the church. This group had been responsible for many of the other 49 Birmingham attacks in the 1950s and 60s that mostly targeted homes and empty churches and had seen many injuries but no deaths. There had been a debate on whether or not the timer worked as it was supposed to, as many of the earlier bombs had gone off at empty churches or in the middle of the night. September 15th was Youth Day at 16th Street Baptist Church, meaning that many of the younger children who attended the church were given special duties and roles in facilitating worship service. Many of these children were at church early that Sunday and pre-worship service Sunday school classes were in session. The lesson topic for that day centered upon the theme, a love that forgives. And at 10.22 a.m. that Sunday, the bomb underneath the back stairs exploded. We're talking about an explosion that reverberates through the entire city of Birmingham. Everybody heard it. I was at South Illerton Baptist Church, and our pastor was shifting kind of nervously across the room and said he had received word that 16th Street Baptist Church had been bombed. I was in Sunday school class. The building seemed like it was shaking off its foundation, fumes, smelling fumes, and getting hit in the head. I couldn't find my younger sister. Only later to find out that she was taken to the hospital. She was only four. She was cut in the head, blood dripping down her clothes and down her face. Reverend John Cross comes down after the explosion to go into the hole and hears moaning. My father heard somebody saying, Annie, Annie, and he realized that Sarah was calling her sister's name because that's the last voice that she heard before the explosion occurred. After the bombing, 16th Street Baptist Church's congregation needed to heal and to rebuild. Major renovations were needed to repair the damage dealt by the explosion, and the church was able to begin that work soon after the bombing because of financial gifts given by members of the community. It was truly an unsolicited grassroots effort to bring the church back to its feet. People gave over $300,000 toward the initial rebuilding effort and the church was able to reopen in June of 1964. The church has been open ever since through rounds of renovations and repairs that continue to better and preserve the building so that the church can live on as a body of worshipers and a house of love that builds, fights, and forgives. The joint funeral for Eddie Mae, Cynthia, and, Den and Denise, as well as Carol's private funeral, were held at other churches in Birmingham and the outpouring of support from movement and national leaders, as well as thousands of mourners, was an important step to begin that healing process for the community. The church itself, 
though their building had been instrumental in the fight for civil rights in Birmingham, took this opportunity to turn inward and care for their church members. Even though they had battled discrimination and terrorism and had been dealt a mighty blow, 16th Street Baptist Church ultimately saw their losses as participation in a greater victory. They know how important their role is in the story of America, and as they continue to grow, they serve their community with service efforts as well as education. An everlasting symbol of the impact that the bombing had on the world rests above the church's pews at the southern end of the sanctuary's balcony. The Wells window was presented to 16th Street Baptist Church by John Petz and the people of Wells. Petz was so moved after hearing of the death of the four girls in Birmingham that he solicited donations from his community to build and send a gift to the church. Rather than have a small number of donors give large sums of money, donations were purposefully kept to small dollar amounts so that children could get involved with the project. And much of the window was, in fact, funded by the children of Wales. Imagery around the struggle for equality and justice is depicted through the window. The depiction of a black man suffering as Christ did is a powerful image and was especially groundbreaking at the time. Emblazoned beneath the image are words taken from the Bible in Matthew chapter 5, verse 40, where Jesus tells a parable that says, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The crucified stance of the Christ figure represents both the horrors of injustice and the promise and beauty of forgiveness. The promise of God to be the ultimate say in both justice and love. The Wells Window is still a dear emblem to 16th Street Baptist Church as it endeavors to share and live out the gospel mission. 16th Street Baptist Church has remained a part of both the larger and local conversations around how to continue to further move towards equality. 16th Street Baptist Church continues to carry the mantle of everybody's church into the present. One major way that the church continues to be part of this is in the partnership with other historical organizations. As they remember a hard history that should not be forgotten, they work to promote dialogues about race, rights, and their impacts on America's history and present. The church is also an important voice and the preservation of other historical sites in the city. And as new development projects emerge, 16th Street Baptist Church helps inform plans and partner with the city to promote tourism and development for the rest of the historic civil rights district. Though much of the church's community work takes place outside its walls, the building itself still hosts speakers, leaders, and events. Annually, the church partners with the Civil Rights Institute and the FBI for a conference that focuses on the historical and present relationships between law enforcement and the community. 16th Street also frequently hosts important civic and political figures. In addition to its service, advo advocacy, and education, the church continues to be a gathering place for those seeking change and justice. And the members of the church remain actively involved in serving the community on local levels as well. The deacons and deaconesses of the church sponsor food and tour drives during the holidays, and the youth ministry is involved with outreach that serves the city's homeless. 16th Street also partners with the city to lead efforts in rehabilitating released prisoners, raising up loving fathers, and building up the community. <laughs>